Hello, hello. Is this thing on? Andrew and Jason, they're not here this week. They're traveling. So it's whatever I want to do this show. Maybe I should check support. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, Kent. (laughs) So if anybody doesn't know, this is Kent, who is our customer support extraordinaire at GoRails now. You probably interact with him if you use Hatchbox uh, support. Welcome. Thanks. Well, I'm wondering if I should try out my podcast voice. How's this? There you go. You got to talk like that for an hour. And then we'll see how you do afterwards. (laughs) And Colin is here too. How are you doing, Colin? I'm doing great. I came to be Kent's nodder or support (laughs) for his first podcast appearance. (laughs) I love it. Kent, do you want to like introduce yourself, your background, how we met, how you got started working at GoRails? be kind of interesting. So I was in customer support for many, many years, but as my sort of hobby, fun stuff after work, is I was trying to learn Ruby on Rails. And I, of course, stumbled upon Ruby on Rails. And as you can tell by my accent, Colin just reminded me, I am Canadian. (laughs) What's that about? So spent a lot of time learning Ruby, interact with Chris, and then later Colin a little bit, just they would always be helpful with little questions I had or tips and tricks. And then last fall, a couple of things happened. One of them was they had a hackathon. And so I just showed up. I was a team of one. Finished something, Kentstagram, the award-winning Kentstagram. Call it in Chris, that was fun. And they said, I got the, I can't believe he finished award. So that was hilarious. So. <laughs> the Kent puns are <laughs> loved around here. The way I got here at GoRails was I just, on this podcast actually, and maybe a few others that Chris uh, guested on, I would hear him occasionally say, oof, this kind of bogged down with support. I wish I could do more stuff. I was like, oh, wait a second. So that I called Chris and said, hey, can we talk? And I said, well, let's talk in the new year. And so we did and things kind of snowballed and voila, here I am. Yeah, so. it's been awesome to have you because I've told several people this, but it's a rare person to find where you really need like a, it's not a customer support person, but almost a customer support engineer. Our support is probably very different than support work mm-hmm. you've been doing in the past where it's very code centric, very technical stuff. Yeah, that's for sure. Way different, but fun. Have you felt like you've been learning a lot over the past oh. almost three months? Something oh like yeah, that? my brain is melting. Yeah, there are some painful debugging sessions sometimes and sure. very in the weeds. There was one time where Colin and I were trying to debug the GoRail server and we wrote a C program to compile some C code to see if we can figure out why Ruby was sec faulting. Turned out that like, the kernel that DigitalOcean would boot was like really old, two major versions old of Ubuntu kernels. So the like system calls on a C level didn't match up to the libraries. There can be some very weird things that you run into with hosting and operating systems and customer support for that stuff. It is wild. I don't even remember how we got there, how we ended up finding that, because I know we spent I forget Um, what exactly the C call was, but it was something with OpenSSL or something around that. Yeah. Yeah, And then like we found somebody also asking that same sort of question. And Mike Perham had been like, sounds like your system's totally screwed up. Should like reformat and start over. And I was like, that's not a good sign. (laughs) But then we ended up poking through the Ruby C source code and found the call where it was blowing up. And then we tried to like write a little C or C plus program to call this system call. And it blew up too. I don't know how it got us down the line, but we were like, this seems like not a Ruby problem, but very much a operating system problem. And somehow we ended up stumbling upon like a DigitalOcean support ticket or something that was like in their forum that pointed to like, that might be because you've like chosen to boot the wrong kernel. And that was before like the latest DigitalOcean servers will like always boot the correct kernel now somehow, or I don't know. You can't change it like you could on these older servers that is one that I'm running. (laughs) So yeah, that was a wild debugging session. Find that because I've never really had to stumble into debugging C code, but that's one that you see like tender love and other people who are doing big, heavy performance work and other things. They're like often dropping down into that 
we're dropping down into like Ruby gems and debug things, but not often going into the C source code of Ruby to debug things. But that's what the pro performance people end up doing sometimes. I think, you know, if you work at GitHub, Shopify, et cetera, I'm sure there are many times they drop in to C, which reminds me of, I need to find that old CSS talk. Somebody that was working on CSS at GitHub was talking about like, if you have a million line diff, that isn't a pull request and you would try and render that out in the browser, it's going to choke because the CSS highlighting might require, if you're naive about it, you put like span tags around every little keyword and highlight the text with the right colors for syntax highlighting plus the lines and you have diffs of lines. So you're going to have duplicates of the same line more or less that you have to highlight green and red. So if you have a million lines, you might end up with 10 million HTML tags that it's got to try and render for you. So it's a nightmare. And they were like writing CSS, but reading the source code to WebKit to like make that possible to do it performantly, which is wild. I can't imagine many front end CSS people actually digging into the browser to like source code to do performance work like that. Yeah, I remember hearing about that too. I don't remember who was talking about. It. I feel like I was hearing about that at RailsConf. Somebody was talking about it. like not didn't give the talk there, but was talking about that article or maybe it was a talk. I don't remember. It's probably me. I bring yeah. it up once in a while. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating now. I found the talk. It looks like from 2012, or at least the slides about it. So if I can find that video, it's probably on YouTube somewhere. But I'll put that in the show notes so people can check it out. But yeah, it's pretty pretty insane. It's quite fun problems at scale like that. We have very small problems in comparison. You're talking about C though, does remind me of a video you had maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, when I was a little bit earlier in the journey and you dropped into C for a little bit of it. And at one point you said, pretty straightforward. And I was like, what? (laughs) Straightforward. Anyways. I wonder if that was making a C extension or something in a Ruby gem. Yeah. Because I looked at the fast blank implementation or something where It basically like adds the blank method, but it's implemented in C. So it's even faster than doing that in Ruby. And I remember looking at that because it's in theory, a straightforward little C program, but actually the production version of it is like quite a lot. It's not even simple. No, probably nothing where you have to drop in from Ruby to C will ever be truly simple. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. This week, we've been having fun working on Hetzner integration for Hatchbox, which has been on our to-do list for a long time and just never really got around to doing that. How have you guys felt about that as a challenge? I feel like it's one of the more complex things about the Hatchbox application and code because we've got to orchestrate all these things that are happening on a API and they may take some time and we've got to wait for things and then... Anything could just be deleted randomly by the customer on their Hetzner dashboard. So it's like writing code on hard mode because you've got this external thing that you don't really control. How's it been? Tough, but interesting. Everything in Hatchbox is, like you mentioned, fairly complicated, but interesting. I always love it, though, as you get closer and closer to the end where you think, oh, actually, it's not that bad. But at first, it seems like a nightmare. <laughs> but eventually, like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, got to create a server, but you have to create a v- private network. And then you've got to make sure all the servers are in that network and then assigned IPs correctly and SSH keys so you can log in and whatever. So it does feel extremely daunting when you're starting out at the beginning. And then once you're like done with it, you're like, oh, that wasn't too bad. There was only like four major concepts, but each one of those breaks down into like for concepts themselves and whatever. So it kind of is like, you don't have a good mental model maybe of the entire process until you're done. And then it's like really concrete and it's like, no, it doesn't feel that hard anymore. But starting out, you have no context and you have to figure all those ideas out conceptually in your head as you go. And it's hard to piece that together. For sure. And for anyone listening who might be like me last year, the year before, Talk about C extensions and Linux servers and Hatchbox. There are beginner videos too. And go Rails. There's a whole new learning path, which is kind of cool too. Yeah, I'm almost done with the new forum series for the learning path, which going from a blog to a forum was like, oh, it's the same thing, but we have an association between 
topics and posts or so it seems, but you'll also have like a lot of other little things where we ended up introducing like, okay, we want to send email notifications about a new post, but to do that, we need a way to turn that off because everybody does not want to get hit with emails for notifications. So I added like a preference on your user to say like, turn off all email notifications, but also like the individual ones you can go and unsubscribe or opt in to subscribe to conversation that you're not even a part of, just like you would do on like GitHub issues. That's where things start getting into the weeds pretty fast where you're like, oh, we built the like basics, but to build a real complete application with like standard features like notifications there's a lot more to it we ended up with like a topic has many posts and a topic has users through the posts but when you want to do notifications that all of a sudden needs the distinct users because we don't want to spam the user who posted in the thread 10 times we don't want to send them 10 emails but then we also need to add in users who opted in remove users who opted out And you probably want a single table for that. The user's subscription to this topic should be basically their opt-in or opt-out. We don't need two different tables, like an opt-in table and an opt-out table. That would be kind of like overkill. So I ended up like doing the associations, but doing a a Lambda to say like, here is opt-in users through the notifications table, but only filter out the ones that have the notifications table where the like type is opt-in. So I ended up like slowly working our way into some like fairly advanced associations and other query stuff into the like beginner content, which is good. I like the natural progression of here's the basics and you want a real complete feature. Guess what? It's no longer basic. We get to learn those like things incrementally as we need them rather than just trying to be like, ah, here's an association and you can use a Lambda if you want to filter. And it's like, okay, but why? I like having the context of the but why when you're learning something. So then you're like, oh, I understand why this exists and why I would use that. Looking forward to getting that out the door. Needs to get a couple last videos. Probably doesn't need them to be launched. So maybe I'll just finish exporting and upload those, but add the videos in next week or something for basically I just wanted to be able to deploy it and just have repetitive learning in there of deploying rails to different hosts. I think that would be nice. So we'll have to get that up and then you can help with support on people having questions on that. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. You just reminded me of like the blog I thought was going to be simple too. the same concept of, ah, we'll just use action text. We don't have to do anything to configure that. But of course you do when you want to have file uploads. And then if you want to have file uploads, you got to do cores and S3 and that stuff's awful. It is not as simple as you would think either. There's no such thing as simple, right? No. You go in two plus two and IRB. Yeah. Just any like real world stuff, the completeness of a feature all hinges on those details. And it can be really hard for you to even predict those will be hard until like you're in the middle of building the feature. It's a strange thing, but you learn that pretty fast when you're building stuff. Oh, I can get the crappy half functional version done in 20 minutes, but the complete thing will take two weeks. Yeah, for sure. I was talking with Ken about this, something I've been trying to be more mindful of doing, even if like the actual first version of a feature is not like the bare minimum kind of thing. I try to cut my first iteration as like extremely naive, just get it functional, right? And then like take a break for a bit. Cause then I free up that brain space to start thinking of other problem areas. I don't have to hold the whole thing in my head. I guess it goes back to like just breaking the things down into small pieces, but I've really been trying to be like super mindful of that lately. I think that's sort of a superpower because if I threw a feature at you, and said, hey, go build this. We could spend two weeks trying to plan that feature out. But the second you get into actually building it, you're like, hey, what about this edge case? And we'll never be able to imagine those edge cases until you build anything. So I really think that like, let's start out with the very, very basics that we know we're going to need and do that. Then it teases out, okay, five hours in, I know exactly 
how much work this is going to be. And it's not what we may have guessed. So I think it's really important to do that because you can't just predict how long something is going to take without that knowledge of where the weeds are at. You have no idea what the weeds are. That's something I used to always bring up in my last gig. I'd be like, I could try and throw you a number of an estimate on the feature, like hour wise or day or whatever wise. But there's also like that variable of the unknown amount of unknowns out there. And, to, and I won't know until I get into it. So yeah. how do you quantify that? Yeah, it's hard. I think you just multiply by three. I'm pretty sure is where by. I mean, when I was consulting, I was like pretty spot on every time where I'd be like, here's my gut, triple it. And then that would be just about right. Almost uh, every time. There you go. It's funny. You heard it here, folks. Yeah. Just multiply by three. <laughs> It's good if you like know how off your intuition is and then have a pretty accurate way to correct off of that. It's yeah. super nice. Or if it is predictable enough that way. But it's probably a little bit down to like, are you doing the same kind of work? Like I was consulting. So we would have a new project and I would not know much about the thing. So I'd have to go learn about it. And that would probably end up being the first week and then I'd have two weeks, like a week to go build the thing. And then in a week, okay, it's mostly built, but there's these all these weird bugs and edge cases that I couldn't have predicted. So that would always factor in or whatever. 80% done, but 80% left kind of situation. Exactly. That's life. Ken, I was going to ask you about on Hatchbox, now that you have deep knowledge of how production works, I feel like this is a thing that a lot of Rails developers, like a lot of our customers don't actually know, like how does DNS work and SSL and all those things. I was going to ask you, what are things you picked up on that like the typical person who's just developed Rails, but never really deployed to production? Maybe you've deployed a Heroku, but don't know the behind the scenes of how all that works. What are some things you've learned and thought were interesting? Two things there. What have I learned? But also I'm trying to perhaps reduce the amount of tickets. So perhaps stick to Rails defaults as much as possible. I would shy away from, at least for now, AWS. <laughs> stick with the other ones <laughs> for now. I feel like we have a lot of questions about SSL. Like, I think it oh. feels like magic to people or something. That is true. It's simpler than it seems, but because it lives outside your Rails application in this config file or somewhere mm -hmm. else, in your web server, I feel like a lot of people are scared or like just don't have any idea what it is or how it works. I feel like it's true, but I also feel that's why they use Heroku or Hatchbox. That's sort of what they're paying for. They're like, oh, good, I don't think about this anymore or ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's been the most partly zero, I think, as long as you again stick to the defaults. If you start getting fancy and oh, I'm going to do this and that, okay, well, you don't mess up AA wrong. <laughs> yeah. But if yeah. you just basics, Caddy or Hatchbox and Caddy will take care of it for you. And then Cloudflare, what's the big thing comes up a lot? Cloudflare is a proxy. So like when a request comes into your domain, it goes through Cloudflare and Cloudflare says, we'll just give you an SSL certificate for mm. your domain. And then they got to still go talk to your application. So then they have to decide. We told the browser like, here's an SSL cert. We just made one up on the spot. But then they have to like go talk to your application and they can choose to talk to you over HTTP or SSL. And so that can be a thing that gets weird. Rails will need to know that if it finished SSL at Cloudflare and Cloudflare says, hey, we'll just send the HTTP over to Rails. Rails needs to know that like SSL was already taken care of. Otherwise, it might see that it's HTTP and redirect you to SSL which will then go back to Cloudflare, back to your browser. It'll already be SSL and it will get a redirect to SSL again, causing an infinite loop. So there are some things like that. If you just slap Cloudflare on, like you should probably understand these proxies and what they do and why they exist. Because yeah, otherwise you end up in infinite loops like that. That's definitely something we see fairly regularly. Yep. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, Honey Badger. If you're like most developers, too much of your time gets sucked up with downtime issues, troubleshooting, and error tracking. How can you spend more time shipping code and less time putting out fires? Honey Badger's how. It's a suite of monitoring tools specifically for developers. It's the only system that combines error monitoring, 
uptime monitoring and cron and heartbeat monitoring into a clean, fast interface. Sure, you can get familiar with any interface, but why waste your time learning some Franken system interface that looks like an airline cockpit when what you really need is clarity and speed? You won't know if Honey Badger will really save you time and trouble until you see how it works in your own tool chain. With two lines of code in five minutes, you can see for yourself. Honey Badger automatically hooks into popular web frameworks, job systems, authentication libraries, and your front end JavaScript. Magic fixing errors before your users can even report them. That is a wonderful way to delight your customers. Five minutes of your time with the free trial is all it takes to see if it will work for you. Just might be the best five minutes you've spent in a while. Check out honeybadger.io. Caddy has been exceptional. Been very happy with that. The like some of the old Hatchbox Classic customers come out periodically, send me a ticket and it's like, hey, SSL isn't working. And that old process, which you never really get to see, is we have Nginx running and that's got a config file. So you got to edit the config file, point it to the SSL certificate to do Let's Encrypt. We'll stop and explain that process. You have to edit the config file or whatever so that you can put a special little code in a URL. So Let's Encrypt can verify that you own that domain. Once you do that, it'll give you an SSL cert and you save it, but you got to edit the config and point it to that now. And if anything fails in that process, you got to like restore the backup of the config. This means also that you have to have the domain pointing to your app correctly already, which is a problem because a lot of people don't do that, or they will point just their IPv4 address to the server. And they also have IPv6, but they leave that pointing somewhere else. And then Let's Encrypt comes in and they're like, yeah, this doesn't match up. So that whole thing has magically been solved by Caddy because they can do it during the HTTP request. So you already have to have the domain set up perfectly to even reach the server. So we don't even have to do any of that stuff at all. Like Caddy does that internally. That's what's magical about it. It's so good. Very happy with that. Yeah, I finally ran into that bug of the open SSL unsupported whatever on Node.js because old Webpacker is like not Node 18 compatible. And I ran into that last Mm -hmm. night or something. I'm glad we don't have to deal with Webpacker anymore. If you haven't upgraded to ES Build, that's the other thing. Please please do. Please, ES Build. (laughs) You'll be very happy. (laughs) Some of those apps that we're deploying for people are like running Webpacker and it takes 20 minutes for them to compile assets with Webpacker, which is yeah. nuts. Like we switched Jumpstart Pro over from Webpacker to ES Build and it's like one or two seconds tops. And all that used to take like sometimes five minutes when you're deploying or more because your server is like, gotta go compile all these assets and it's not doing a whole lot because ES Build can do it in a fraction of the time. The front end tooling is definitely, I wish it was more standardized in Rails. That would be much nicer. What else is new with you guys? We've been busy this week, but mostly on Hetzner support. I'm running a little low on maple syrup, but otherwise things are good. Is that like a national? (laughs) The Canadian uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to have Canadian syrup rations. Yeah. Maple syrup. That could be very bad if you guys didn't have that. I just want some poutine. And poutine. That's true. Actually, the Podia guys who normally are here on the podcast, they were in Montreal, I think. Hope they got a lot of poutine. We have some places down here that make good poutine, but I haven't had truly authentic poutine. So maybe ours is just terrible in comparison. I don't know. I have to come visit and try it. You got to come up, come up and try it. Yeah, all sorts. <laughs> There's one downtown where they have these cardiac, the heart attack. It's a trough. With so much poutine for 10 or maybe 20 people, I forget. Typically sold around 2 or 3 a.m. when the bars close and people are stumbling home and they get their heart attack poutine for a whole party. That stuff, like those like massive burgers and stuff. Like I don't want to be eating a burger and then half of it's cold. But it seems like if you were to do one of those, like most of your poutine or whatever it is that you're eating is probably going to be cold by the time you get to it. (laughs) Like, no thanks. Yeah. That just reminds me of that burger place we went to. We're out at Vortex. Vortex. Is that what it was? Yeah. This episode is brought to you by the Vortex. 
<laughs> yeah, the World Tex, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That was yeah, cool they game. had uh, the double bypass, triple bypass, and yeah. whatever. There was something like 27 slices of bacon, 12 ounces of mayonnaise, 32 kilograms, no, pounds? I forget. It's a lot. It was, yeah, it was huge. Ounces, it was 32 ounces. Wow. Yeah, the ounces messed me up. I'm really used to those measurements. <laughs> yeah, like, what, uh, what's next an ounce? <laughs> you guys with your <laughs> metric time up there? Yeah, grams and kilograms. I was going to ask Kent some questions. First of all, now that you've been like working with us versus you know just doing your own thing on the side, mm-hmm. do you have anything, tips, advice, guidance, or anything that you would pass along to someone like in your shoes of yesterday, so to speak? For a lot of people who are, I guess, like me last year, it is tough, like, especially depending on your job or time of year. If it's a rough time, it's hard to be consistent. But that was the one thing I started to do a little bit towards the end of last year. And I'd recommend is no matter what, yeah, be consistent. Even if it's something as ridiculous as like five minutes or something, whatever it is, just so you're always in a habit. Read books. Do things like, well, watch Go Rails videos, of course. A shameless plug. But also, if you get a chance to look at Jumpstart, just reading code, like just as some people have suggested, reading other gems, maybe, or Jumpstart's a good one, or a different, I'm trying to think of another one that's more open source would be good. But. This course was one that I showed at the beginning of our forum series, because I was like, here, you know, we're going to build a simple version of Discourse, but if you want a real production forum, look at this. And I like, just to scare the beginners, I opened up the models folder in, in Discourse's GitHub, and it's like, 200 some models in there or whatever for a forum. And you're like, is it really that complicated? Yes, it is. <laughs> but it can be really useful to like just poke around and see how they organize things. Even if it's just a little like they order their scopes and their hashes or their uh, associations and whatever else in a certain order. Like sometimes you'll pick up a little tiny thing mm-hmm. that are like, oh, that's how they keep this organized. Mine has always been messy. So now you can like pick up a little tidbit there or whatever, but yeah, I think that's really good advice. And the last thing I would say is to actually build something, no matter how small, because the reading and everything is great watching the videos, but if you don't actually type something again, no matter how small, that's where I've learned the most It's because it would break. I'm like, what well, worked in the video or something that, but as you eventually figuring it out and I've told Chris this a few times, my favorite part of a lot of the videos is when things break for Chris or other people. Not for two reasons, because you say, oh, even Chris makes mistakes. <laughs> Not many, but, nah. <laughs> then, but then you see how he fixes it. You say, like, oh, that's how you debug things. Well, that's how you find so, that. So unfortunately, I couldn't record this video in the moment because that would have spanned two days. But I just recorded a video that will come out sometime around this episode for Go Rails that the old hatchbox, I had a customer be like, hey, DigitalOcean OAuth doesn't work anymore. And I was like, that's not good. So I went and tried it myself, got the same error, and then spent, say, three or four hours debugging it and basically just recorded a screencast walking through how to do, how I did all the debugging for that myself to figure out the solution and then make a PR, make a fork, fix it, make a PR. And then that got released yesterday as well as part of the OmniAuth DigitalOcean library. But that is very good advice to like see. I wish I could keep more of the like debugging stuff in the screencast. It can be very distracting if it's like typos and other things because we'll end up in the weeds for five minutes or 10 minutes and then we'll forget about what we're actually trying to build sometimes. So I like that was my goal from day one was to include all of that stuff, but maybe like cut it out and do a bonus follow-up episode out of it, but it was kind of incoherent to like do that as well. Unfortunately, I don't have as many videos like that, but I'm trying to. And that's why like I recorded this video this morning about that debugging process because I want to share more of that because I think you're right. I think Colin and I have talked about this. Like one of the things that sets somebody apart from being a junior and being like a mid-level developer is the mid-level person will figure it out eventually. But I feel like a lot of juniors will just be like, I'm lost and I will never figure out this answer unless I stumble across the answer on Google somehow. And they'll like change their search results, but that's all they do rather than looking at 
what is the code and what is the error? They're kind of afraid of looking through the stack trace and they don't understand it. So like Colin and I, have, I know we have talked about that many times. Like you can pretty much solve these problems without going to Google. If you actually look at the stack trace, break it down. What's the last line of code I wrote? What is that? Where did it go? What does that code expect? Did I give it something wrong and do the debugging process that way instead of here's the error message, paste it into Google, click the first result. No, nope. click the second <laughs> one, click the third one. You're like, keep rolling the dice every time. And sometimes you get lucky, which is good, but I feel like it's not a consistent thing. And that to me has been like a, an easy way for me to tell junior developer versus like a mid-level developer. They have that down. Yeah. I also feel like you rob yourself of a bit of the learnings there, right? Because you're just like, I tried that answer. It didn't work. Cool. Now I'm moving on without really getting the understanding of what actually happened there. Do you feel like the co-pilot and GPT stuff is in similar vein where it's kind of throwing stuff at you that you're not forced to truly comprehend? The folks that can't see it right now because we're on Zoom, I got a smile as big as like the Grinch on my face just now. <laughs> I'm just going to say yes. I feel like if you jump into that stuff without having any kind of really foundational knowledge about either your language or framework that you're using, you're really robbing yourself of growth there. I think it to me, it feels like trying the Stack Overflow suggestions, but rather than having to search for them, they just appear right away. Yeah. And it's like even more intrusive that way, where it's not like it doesn't know. It's just suggesting things. It's not actually comprehending your problem. So they've taken one step out of the equation, but not the right step. I found it really useful for repetitive things where you're building API requests out and it's like, can intuit them from whatever you define the method name. And it's like, boom, you're going to need this because I saw it two lines up above and I can copy that. But it does seem a little... Yeah. But it's blind. But it, like it's... It doesn't understand. Yeah. I think you both would agree that if you can't, and you were both writing that same API integration and both using something like Copilot, if both of y'all just tab completely, like, yep, I'll take the suggestion, take the suggestion. <laughs> when it goes wrong, Chris, you're probably going to be able to get through it a little bit faster. And no, nothing against you can at all. Like, I think you're going to say, say Chris, but, Chris, yeah. picks up, picks up immediately. And I'll go, what the heck? I guess it's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he's got decades of foundational and more complex knowledge there in, in thing already. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it looks like it's better for a beginner at first glance. I think you're saying a really experienced developer to make better use of chat GPT or something. Yeah, because yeah, I think it frees up your mental space and not worry about, like Chris said, like the boilerplate sort of stuff. And then you can just kind of like, after it spits out what it does, read through it real quickly and be like, yeah, okay, like this line, I need to change some because I know, I just know right from looking at it that this is not going to be exactly what I want versus just being like, it looks good, run it, let's see. It reminded me of something Raphael said at RailsConf about he can review the PRs for Rails where he just looks at the shape of the code sometimes and can tell if it's <laughs> correct or not. And I thought that was amazing. And it feels similar where like, if I read a suggestion on Stack Overflow or something that snippet, after time, you can just glance at it and into it like, nope, this is not going to do what I want or it can. And you don't have to like read every word of it and understand every little piece of it. You can kind of like, I roughly know this is calling this library, which has this thing and whatever. At a high level, you grasp like the concept of what it's trying to do. Whereas in your earlier days in your career, then it's like, you actually probably should type out every line of that Stack Overflow thing yourself so that you are actually paying attention to every word. Because you're probably by default just going to look at it. I don't know. Sounds right. The way he described it in his post about this is what I would do and here's why. You like probably read that and understand it and then just copy paste the piece of code and try that out rather than reasoning through the code. There was one that actually I came across this week looking at using Ruby to detect in your path if an executable exists. And that was 
interesting to see all the different solutions people had on Stack Overflow. One of them, probably the like simplest, most correct answer was to require Ruby has a make file library that you can use for building C extensions. And it has a find executable helper in it that you can use because that's what it needs to do to find the like compilers and stuff like that for compiling your C extensions. So you can require that and it can like look up the executable, but then it turns out method will like it wraps an actual find executable zero, which is like their private method. I'm not sure why it's got the zero at the end, but it's undocumented and stuff. But it's the one that actually does the work and doesn't print out like the checking for GCC because the regular find executable does. So the, of course, the advice is basically like you could use that, but it's going to print out words and standard out, which you may not want. So then your other option is to call find executable zero. But if you use that, then you're using an undocumented method, which could break in the next version of Ruby. And then what are you going to do? And you can't trust that as much. And then there was like other option that somebody used, which was basically like, we'll use the path and the path extension or whatever the environment variable there is. There's like two path variables. And then we'll go through and split those, but Windows doesn't separate the path by colons. I think it's semicolons or whatever. Because it's like using the colon and C colon slash slash for your uh, drives and everything. So there's is different. So you got to take into account that and you got to take into account all these other little things and check and see if the file exists and is it flagged executable and whatever. So it was interesting to like read those suggestions in Stack Overflow and I could look at different ones and be like, you know, the find executable zero seems perfect, which is what I would ideally use but it's undocumented and that means it's riskier. So do I really want to do that? But if we like reinvent the find executable with our own, like parsing the path and looking through these directories, was that going to have the same issues? Maybe it's going to be less portable or whatever. So I ended up, I think using the Ruby version of it. There was a couple little nuances to the make file thing, but yeah, just trying to like, choose the right version of code. There's a lot of decisions to make when you're like, you want to do something like that. You can use utilities that exist. Maybe they don't work exactly the way you want. So you got to build your own Mm -hmm. rabbit holes you can go down. But those decisions, I feel like make a big difference in the final result of your code and how long it will last before it breaks. Because it will always break at some point. (laughs) Yeah. I guess the final point there too, I guess in a way, the tools like your Copilot and chat GPT stuff to some extent, I guess is like, it depends on how much you care about. I don't want to say this in a way that makes it seem like someone doesn't care about their craft, but I guess that's kind of what I'm saying here is like, how much do you really care to understand what you're writing? Do yeah. you I do that yeah. a lot or do you just like, I kind of just want to get this done and move on kind of thing. It's maybe not about caring, but what's your goal is your goal to get it done and shipped in the shortest amount of time. Because then you can pick whatever the simplest solution is and whatever, but it may not be compatible with the next major version of Ruby, or it might have this dependency you use that may break in a few months, or you can use the like do it from scratch method, which isn't going to break in the future. And I think it depends on whoever's writing it. What is their immediate goal? Is it trying to ship it today or is it trying to build something that won't break ever? And I feel like I try to write code that these days, it used to be trying to get something to work today. I'll start there, but then I'll always be keeping in mind like, okay, is this going to really work forever or is it likely to break? Yeah, makes sense. The last question I'll ask you, what has been your favorite thing about coming onto the team? Oh, well, that's easy. Just learning all the Ruby and Rails stuff, but kind of, as you guys were saying, like the right way, like building for the future and just all the time we spend pairing, just the way you guys answer all my questions patiently, <laughs> but also like with context and like, this is why we do it. And like, okay, thanks. And just learning like all that stuff has been amazing. One support thing that happened though, that I really love too, kind of related. Somebody wrote in and he was very confused about a lot of things that were happening, but because I had been doing support just long enough and rails just long enough, 
I recognized myself from like a year ago, maybe two years ago. I was like, oh, I know what's happening here. So I took the time to actually explain not just what his problem was with the current deploy, but in general, like I broke down all the things for him. And then I came out of the conversation. He was trying to do something with Tailwind. And this is kind of fun. And then Chris mentioned something about it being an official plugin. I was like, what? So I looked into it a little bit. I said, oh, I'm going to do a call and just help me. So downloaded the code and I actually made a pull request for the Tailwind gem that got accepted. I'm like, oh, that was fun. And then I wrote to the guy back and said, hey, it's fixed. You just have to redo this. And so that was super fun for me and him. He was pretty happy, I think. I remember that. That was a good one because it was like line clamp or aspect ratio or one of those. Yes. It was like ships by default in the Tailwind CSS thing. So it was like all of them, but one of the plugins were required in the config file that it generates. And so we added, here's all the available ones. They might as well all be turned on by default. So that was a great contribution there. I was going to ask you, has your experience been that when a bug comes up, the answer is always, there's not a simple answer. It's complicated because I feel like that is every time when we're like looking through support tickets or something, it's like, this didn't work. And we go to <laughs> fix it. And then we're like, yeah, well, currently it works the way it should. But in this one case, we probably need to do it differently for that situation or whatever. And it feels like the common theme is basically like everything is harder than it looks. <laughs> for sure. Yep. My question will be, what is the worst thing about joining the team? <laughs> You're on the spot because uh, everybody's going to hear this too. I would say if you going to ask it, I was going <laughs> to ask it, but I was like, you know what? I'll ask the other, the opposite case person. <laughs> I <laughs> had to when you did, so you baited me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the worst thing is Friday. I don't know because I'm literally excited to work. So like on the weekends, I'm still pulling out the Ruby books and stuff. Whereas on Monday, I'm like, oh, good. It's time to go back to work. There hasn't really been a worst thing. When I got my first Rails job, I like, well, I was working Saturdays, Sundays, nights, like just kept doing Rails because it was just, it's so much fun. So like, it's just such a fun position to be in where you're like, I can't wait to work. It feels rare to get a job like that. And I feel like we're all super lucky because for me, I like doing a lot of the open source and the stuff that we're doing is not something you get in a normal job. Maybe if you're working at the infrastructure teams at Shopify, building like the tooling for the community, that is a similar position that we are in. But we get to like build stuff, do it open source and teach things, learn things, try new stuff that nobody's ever done. If DHH drops a new framework on Christmas Eve, like old Hotwire again, then we get our Christmas present is uh, going to learn this new thing and then try and teach it and use it. It's rare. I feel like it's a blast. I think we all probably have those moments where like, oh, God, like in a miserable state right now with whatever I'm working on. Like, I always try and like take a step back and realize like, Colin, do you remember like four years ago when you were working in that tile warehouse? Well, at this point, it's not four years ago. I guess this is like six or seven now. <laughs> but it's like, you remember when you were stacking those boxes of tile four feet high on a pallet? This is better than that. Yep. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I think unless there's anything else, we can wrap up. You guys can take a early Friday afternoon leave and go down a gallon of maple syrup. Yeah, exactly. Tell you black out. Well, get a good pellet of maple syrup. <laughs> yeah. You ever seen those people that try and like swallow like a whole thing or like cinnamon or whatever? Oh, yeah, yeah that's dangerous. Don't do that, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go watch those videos. They're fun to watch. Yes, the videos are fun. That's true. Cool. Well, I will catch you guys next week. See you. See you. See you.